Uh, I just want to welcome everyone who's here to this, the fifth annual uh, National Library Week celebration and Duke Law School graduate <laughs> alumni authors celebration. I'm Marguerite Most, and I'm just going to take a minute to thank the other co-sponsors along with the library and then hand this over to Kate Bartlett. Professor Bartlett's going to introduce our speaker, Jacinda Townsend. So this is supposed to be a very casual, informal presentation, I think. And Jacinda has lots of good stories. And if you haven't read this book, you really should. I loved it when I read it. It's opening in. Kentucky in the 1950s, 19, early, late 1950s, early 60s, but I think it's much more universal than that, what she's talking about. Our co-sponsors for the event are the Black Student Law Association and the Women's Law Association. And I also wanted to just uh, take a moment to, to thank Sue Hicks, who arranged all of the travel arrangements and the pizza and all of the getting together of everything here. So. Um, I think that's it, Kate. Do you right, right. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Kate Bartlett. Well, thank you again. I'll add my thanks to Marguerite for everybody uh, who came. I am really thrilled today to introduce Jacinda Townsend to talk about one of my favorite books, Saint Monkey. Um, Jacinda is from South Central Kentucky, where the book is situated. She left Kentucky to go to Harvard and then to this very law school where she graduated, from which she graduated in 1995, then to New York to practice law. And then, so far that path may seem familiar to some of you, but then she went to the Iowa Writers Workshop to earn an MFA degree and to begin her career uh, as a writer. Uh, and she finds herself now at Indiana University where she teaches creative writing. Jacinda has succeeded at the secret, or in some cases not so secret, ambition of many of us here, that is to be a fiction writer. Saint Monkey has won numerous awards, including the James Fenimore Cooper Prize for Historical Fiction, the Janet Heidinger Kafka Prize for Fiction, awarded by the Susan B. Anthony Institute for Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Rochester. This is a prize, by the way, um, previously won by such notables as Ann Tyler, Ann Patchett, Ursula Le Guin, and Toni Morrison. Saint Monkey was the 2015 Honor Book for the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. It was long listed for the Flaherty Dunn First Novel Prize and short listed for the Crooks Corner Book Prize here in the Triangle area. It was reviewed with high praise, excuse me, yeah, high praise in the New York Times Sunday Book Review and was recommended by Juno Dias in the uh, Dias in the New Yorker as among the best summer reads of 2015. And in 2014, it was named by The Root as one of the 15 best works published by black authors in that year. There are a number of recent works probing the depths of, of best friend relationships, uh, and Saint Monkey is certainly one of the most uh, compelling. I want to congratulate Jacinda on this most amazing accomplishment and welcome her to speak about the book. Jacinda. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you to Dean Bartlett, and thank you to Marguerite Most for inviting me, and thanks to the library for having me, and also BALSA and the Women's Law uh, Student Association. It's really nice to be back. Um, I can't believe how much everything has changed, but it remains so incredibly beautiful. Um, so I, I, you know, when I came to Duke, I came right out of college, um, and I was 20, and I had no idea how to sort of fit a whole life into anything. Um, I had no idea. I, th I think, you know, past me also had no idea what future me was like or even what me was like. Um, <laughs> and so I found myself um, not too long after that on a on a kind of different path. But I want to 
I want to say that I really appreciate now um, how much Duke was committed to sort of like the whole. Duke was more committed to the whole than maybe I was when I was here. Um, Dean Bartlett is actually the person who signed off for me to take a third fiction writing workshop I cross-registered in the English department when I was here. And it, it's um, really nice, you know, that, that Duke Law School is, is focused not just on sort of the, um, you know, the narrow person, but the whole person as part of a whole education. Um, so without further ado, I will read um, from the part of this book that is mostly set in North Carolina. So this happens later in the book when much of the plot is already in place, but just to, to set this up a little bit, um, this young, young girl has married this much older man. Um, it's 19, it's the late 1950s, so this is in some ways not that unusual, but she's about to get a reaction. Um, and they're both jazz musicians. Come New Year's Eve, I did play the Roseland with August, then went with him to an after party in Queens where we kissed at the stroke of midnight, oblivious to everyone else in the room, their paper 1961 glasses and their whiskey-soaked drink umbrellas. The next Monday, August put most of the $400 into our joint bank account and laughed as he gave me $50 worth of what he called mad money. I was going to use part of it to take him on a date. I meant to spend my 19th birthday sipping grasshoppers from my fiancé's straw, leaning my head against his cologne shoulder while we watched Thelonious Monk play town hall. Every day in December, I'd walked past the posters pasted to construction barriers, orange edging with sky blue letters, the T of town and the H of hall slightly enlarged. Thelonious himself immortalized in black silhouette at his piano, as though he would never again rise to eat or kiss his wife or use the toilet. I'd pass under the scaffolding and note the date. January 25th, 1961, and the address, 113 West 43rd. I'd even collected change for the bus ride downtown and back, as I was so often without small change in New York City. For once, before our relationship became something else altogether, I'd wanted to treat August. Too late now, we're married. It's what I did with my 19th birthday. We just bust ourselves into Hickory, North Carolina, and August took me to the downtown courthouse, and we signed the papers. I had no white dress, no bouquet of daisies. August had no best man and no gold band for me because I hadn't had the money. Strange, considering August and I played almost 20 New York weddings together, but we had no one to play at ours. Melodies settled in our ears as we walked up the courthouse steps, but neither of us could be certain we were imagining the same song as the other, let alone the same arrangement. We would have been too embarrassed, standing before the judge and the court clerks, to hum. August had, at least, French kissed me for a full minute while with the judge who'd called him boy tried to hand us our papers. I couldn't tell whether it was defiance or love. What were you thinking, I asked him later, all that time you were kissing me? He'd only joke, daydreaming about lunch, every fiber of fish and every pecan in the pie. For our honeymoon, we've taken the bus up to Kentucky to tell my mother. You're what? She yells as though her hearing is shot. Married? Mr. Barnett, on his way out to the country to pick up a side of beef, has dropped us off at the edge of Mr. Barber's yard, where we walked up the stone steps to find Mother sitting in one of his green metal glide chairs. Dead of the coldest January on record, and a full week before Groundhog's Day, but the sun has come out between snows and offered a day of warmth that will save the minds of the people of Mount Sterling. Sunday, for once this year, might live up to its name. At 10 in the morning, sunlight glances off the iced in branches and gives the trees a fiery new life. Lucky for my brother, baby Nate, who's two years old and weary enough of the house that he's trying nail by nail to tear down what his daddy built. When he hears mother upset, Nate makes his wobbly run to her chair where he balances himself against an arm and tugs at the bottom of her rose sweater. 
She swats his hand away without even looking at him. How can you be married, she asks me. You're only 19. You just turned 19 yesterday. Mother turns to August, speaking to him for the first time. And how old are you? He rocks forward, and I can see the outline of his knuckles in his pockets as he clenches in his fist. I'm 30, ma'am. Just turn. My and Audrey's birthdays are the same week. Isn't that something? My good God, she yells, she says, then yells through the open window at her back. Jonas, get out here. I'm asleep, he whines. What you need? Just get yourself on out here. Even baby Nate is silent as the four of us listen to each stair creak with Mr. Barber's sleepy weight. What? Oh, hey, Audrey's back. Who is the young fellow? Ain't chaperones usually ladies? Well, that would be her husband, Mother says. She scoops Nate into her lap and cries into his hair as she rocks him. Oh, hey, now, Mr. Barber says. You know your mama hasn't, been, hasn't drunk anything. She's been dry as a bone going on a year now. We don't want to upset her, make her nerves come back. He puts a hand on Mother's shoulder. He shuts his eyes tight and opens them again. So recently has he been asleep, he's likely wishing he were still standing in his dreams. It'll be all right, he says to Mother. We'll get to the bottom of all this. But the seconds pass, and he doesn't find any other words. He seems unable to take his eyes off Mother's shoulder. Water begins to drip from the tree at the edge of the porch, making pox in the snow. This is what people do in New York City, Mother asks. Grown men marry babies. I'm not a baby, and I'm, we're not in New York anymore. I can't remember ever seeing my mother cry when she wasn't also drinking, and without a cushion of alcohol to keep them fierce, her eyes seemed gelatinous in their misery, like a beaten horse's. Where you been living, she asks. Why didn't you let us know where you was? I ought to kick my own ass for ever letting you trot up there in the first place. No, mother, it's been wonderful. I'm having a wonderful life. Wonderful is married at 19. Your daddy was alive. He'd kill us all. I guess you're pregnant. Not yet, Not yet, I say, but it isn't for lack of trunks. Sorry. Every time I read this, I imagine my own kid telling me this, and I <laughs> can't help but laugh. Not yet, I say, but it isn't for lack of trying. I can't help but grin at August, whose face has gone ashen. Mother starts sobbing. Mr. Barber just keeps staring down at her shoulder. Over and over, he rubs her back through her sweater, as though he's looking to unweave its knit. Our gig at the Apollo got, well, no matter. We're on the road. This week, Charlotte, then Greensboro, then Winston-Salem. Next month, we'll play the islands. I'll be living on a beach, Mother. That so? Your daddy went off to live at the beach. Next thing you know, he's dead. Mother puts a hand over her mouth, inadvertently bumping, Nate, bumping Nate's forehead with her bake light bracelet. It couldn't have hurt, but my brother begins to wail, and Mr. Barber lifts him from Mother's lap and carries him back into the house. Poor baby Nate, who hasn't yet learned to count. I myself had this gift of numbers. No matter how far things deteriorate, August and I have to be back on the bus to Charlotte in 26 hours and 18 minutes. Audrey... Get the keys to Jonas's car and get out here. We're going into town. Mr. Barber's kitchen stands darker than it should, given the sun's sudden winter appearance, and I find myself wondering if anything at all good ever penetrates his windows. Baby Nate screams louder, even as Mr. Barber bounces him on his knee, and Mr. Barber himself looks more afraid than he did on the porch, but he's not at all surprised when I ask for the car. Take care of your mama, is all he says. He hands over his ring of four keys. Mother's learned to drive in the months I've been away, and I can't help but be proud of the way she shifts into her different gears and paddles her foot from clutch to foot feed without missing even one beat of crying. A dead rabbit lies splayed on its side in the shoulder of the road, and I'm reminded that to be in the country is to be surrounded by death, always. I'm sorry, Mother, I say. So um, I wanted to tell, talk a little bit about um, why I even started writing this book and, and the process of writing it. Um, it was kind of, um, in some ways, it started out as a love letter to a time and a place that's almost gone or 
well, is in some ways gone. And that's that um, there's a ring of hamlets around Lexington that was founded by freed, newly freed slaves, and the slaves were assigned to take care of the horses in horse country. Um, over the years, you know, people, and, and this has kind of been rapidly hastened in recent years, that people have moved away. People have gone to Lexington. People have gone to Louisville. These old ways are dying. You know, they used to... Um, it, everything was kind of, it was kind of farm to table, right? And they had their own sort of um, culture, um, even even language in some sense is dying. So I used a lot of the language that people use in that part of the world. Um, but I really wanted to sort of get it down, you know, before it died. Um, so there were kind of, there were three sort of main vehicles of research for this. One was just... I, I knew a lot about the music industry of today. I knew almost nothing about the music industry in the 50s. So I just, I read a lot of like kind of like basic, um, you know, books. But then I also, um, I read magazines because I felt like I didn't know what the mores were and what the values were. And I also interviewed people. So what's kind of interesting about um this particular, these particular two scenes, um, when you listen to music of the 50s, and I, and I have to admit, like, I'm a big music fan. I was not a fan of music of the 50s. But when you listen to it, there's an awful lot of grown men hanging out with younger women. Um, there's a lot of it. And as I read through magazines, because I felt like those in some ways were more accurate documents of a culture than, like, books, you know, um, I found that that was sort of accepted. When I interviewed the people, that was my third layer, layer of research, is I interviewed people who had been this age at that time. Um, I found that, you know, it, it, was, it was more accepted than it is now, but it wasn't necessarily something people didn't talk about, you know. Um, so I'm going to read to you um, the scene where her grandfather meets this older gentleman. Um, when Grandpap sees me coming up his sidewalk with August, he stands up from his new porch swing and shakes his head. Not so much at us, I gather, as at himself. After 68 years in the world, he can no longer always be certain of what he sees. Age has carried his body a far piece in the year I've been away, or perhaps it's just that I never noticed the pinching of his mouth and the blossoming of hair in his ears when I had daily watch of them. He says my name with tears in his bluing eyes. I'm his lone pigeon returned to roost, and he holds his embrace of me for such a length of time that I'm able to count a score of shy heartbeats traveling up his chest. I'll leave it to August to tell him we're not staying, we're only visiting. Granddaddy, this is my husband. He shakes August's hand as gently and easily as if I've offered him a sandwich. Right pleased to meet you, he says, but he hikes up his pant legs and sits back down without offering August a place in the swing. He doesn't invite us into the house, though the sun is just starting to dip behind the mountain and our arms are chilled underneath our coats. How old is this feller, Grandpap asks me, without taking his eyes off August's. Thirty, August answers. I ask my granddaughter, 30, I say. It says so on his birth certificate. 30. That means he ain't in high school, which means he must do something for a living. Grandpap keeps August locked in his sights. Now I am talking to you, he says, and sets himself to rocking. I'm a bassist, sir. A musician? Yes, sir. I make a comfortable enough living out of it, sir. Well, that's good. Ain't too many of them what does. Grandpap manages to lower his bushy eyebrows and make himself look satisfied, but it comes out that he isn't. Over a dinner of breakfast, hot cakes he's smothered in butter, and sausage with hot pepper seeds he's ground tiny as dust flakes, Grandpap rakes questions over August. How long has he played for money? Eight years. Who has he played with? Jackie Byard and Elvin Jones. Anybody we would have heard of? McCoy Tyner. No. Pharaoh Sanders? Maybe. Where all has he played? Cafe Society. 
Connie's in, the five spot. You get booed off the stage? That how you met my Audrey? It was a regular gig we had together, sir. Had? What happened? I've got 17 hours to le left to find my best friend, and answering all Grandpap's doubts will take a lifetime. Granddaddy, I say, let the man eat his supper. Your daddy's dead, so I'm the man who has a right to know. They threw out our contract, sir. Well then, people don't generally throw things out midstream less than the things is causing them trouble. Grandpap sets his fork and knife down on either side of his plate so that they stand like soldiers waiting for order. August looks glumly at his island of hot cakes. He bites into a piece of sausage and spice waters his eyes. They threw out his contract, I say, because he was living on his feet. Grandpap's eyebrows rush up upward again, and he retakes his silver, pushing his knife through the tines of his fork to saw out a piece of sausage. Man ought to make sure he can feed his wife before he goes standing on his feet, he says, but he doesn't sound like he means it. He chews and swallows, making a couple of minutes during which neither August nor I dare breathe. So, he asks, if you can play bass, that means you might can fiddle, too. Yes, sir. Well, it just so happens I got one in the back room. Granddaddy, I say, but he's already up and tapping himself to the back of the house. Hey, Lolita, August whispers. What's old Grandpa really going back there for? His jar of arsenic? He rolls his eyes, and I giggle. Grandpap returns with a blank expression that confirms he's heard nothing. Well, all right, son, he says, handing over his fiddle. He thrusts his splintered bow forward, grazing August's forehead with its frog, but he won't acknowledge having hit him. He won't apologize either for interrupting the man's dinner. August takes up his bow and sews together a child not quite ragtime and not quite bluegrass, of movement so undeniably precious and rare as to make me and Grandpap feel that this is the afternoon for which we've lived 84 collective years. He heads into 5-2 time, shuts himself into the pentatonic scale, revolves back into bluegrass, and Gr Grandpap dips his head with the shame of having to wipe away a tear. If August knows then that our ears are melting, his face reveals nothing. He's simply saving the day with his hands. He plants the fiddle deeper in the crook of his neck and frowns, transects Grandpap's fiddle with the camber at every possible angle, and the thing he hatches takes me and Grandpap back past the telegram from South Korea, back past the time either of us, either of us ever saw the word colored atop a water fountain past that day in childhood when we first discovered our fingers wouldn't reach the sky, no matter how high we stretched. August plays, and my grandfather and I are reborn. Best damn fiddler I ever heard, Grandpap says, when he's finished. The curtains are still parted, and I can see the moonlight as a faint smear across the tops of the trees. Snow will be back in Mount Sterling by morning. Grandpap invites us to stay the night, the weekend. But don't y'all dare think of living here, he says, as August hands him back his fiddle and bow. Ain't a body south of the Mason-Dixon line knows how to treat a black man got that kind of talent. Y'all need to move on over to Paris, France. That's where all the famous one goes. Um, and I guess, you know, one, one thing I want to say about that passage is that um, it's been interesting sort of making a move from someone who had only published short stories to someone who's um, the subject to a whole marketing machine. Um, in sort of one of the things that happened um, was that the book really changed a lot. A lot, there was a lot more of this, um, and I, I'm a pretty basic musician, as mu musicians go, but there was a lot more of this book that was about that. It was about the music world. It was about a lot of the plot actually revolved around the music world. Um, it changed tremendously because I think, you know, what people felt was more marketable was a story that was about the friendship. I'm happy with the changes, but it, it was really, um, it's really quite interesting. And I feel like, too, um, it's a lot of writers, when they get to the end of the book, have basically 
killed a part of themselves, you know. So the part of myself that um, had written this book without even knowing it about sort of my own relationship to my father um, is still, it's still very much in here, but I ended up because of, for, you know, industry reasons, writing a book that was about something else entirely. So it's it's interesting, that transition from sort of like, writing what you want to writing what um, the world wants, right? Um, it's interesting. I'll put it like that. I'll read one more passage, short one, and then I'll take questions. And I realize I made you dean again. So that, that was me trying to be young again. Once again. Right? <laughs> okay, so this is the part that's set more squarely in North Carolina. So you may um, find this very familiar. Days on a beach are days of small deaths. The quiet balls itself into a punch, and the chill air sharpens mornings that march toward nothing. Je Jelly Roll's a cat. Jelly Roll naps for the most part, resting up for a long night of pretending to hunt. Boredom builds barriers of dread across the mind's peace, and the rolling carpet of water carries itself off to no visible end. The Outer Banks is not for those who haven't yet squared reality with infinity. I excuse myself. I couldn't have known. For August, who has always lived in the city, ochre coke is an escape, a cleansing. When we first arrived, he sat each morning burying his toes, wondering like a child at the orange she glass and the crab skeleton strangled in seaweed. Nights, he made me go out with him to watch the lonely beacon of the lighthouse, to listen to the boats bringing their whistles of mourning from the mainland. But after two weeks here, even he's beginning to see past the magic, straight through to the endless non-ending. Outside of the dances, he no longer plays his bass. He won't even let it out of its case, and complains that the humidity is wrecking its varnish. We make love sometimes at dawn, mornings, I cry. Thinking about how I've embarrassed my best friend, I tell him, and he makes the most awful face before leaving me in bed alone. He reads the news record and fights with me over what it tells him, calls me country and a clod, says my entire reading life has been wasted on fantasy, wonders aloud how he ended up marrying so far beneath himself. Then, as though being in the same room with me will reduce his IQ, he goes to stand on the back porch of our boarding house, as though staring at squirrels should be more engaging than speaking to his wife. He hums to himself, looks for loose feathers to give to Jelly Roll, peels bark off a tree trunk. From the window, I watch, appraise. His work is beginning to reveal itself up on one of the lower branches. If we stay here long enough, he might unpeel the whole tree. I'm on the couch dreaming about the telephone when it rings. I want to speak to my son, someone says. I'm sorry, Mrs. Barnes, but he's out for the morning. Out where? Where could he have got to at seven in the morning? Fishing. It's true. My husband has gone native on us with a straw sun hat, a long rod, and a reel that looks like the barrel of a gun, a Fred Arbogast jitterbug on the end for bait. He's out every day before the sun, even when we've gone to bed at two. You'd think I'd sleep through his leaving by now, but I don't. It hurts enough to wake me every time. Fishing? My mother-in-law asks. Yes, ma'am. He catches quite a bit, actually. All my son's going to catch out there is a cold. She herself clears some phlegm in her throat. I should think you'd be able to keep him in mornings. Well, he is a grown man. On her end of the line, I hear the faintest music, a rising and falling of delicate chimes like the movement of a music box. He hurts me, this son of hers, so much. I don't have the netting to hold it all in, and the sta sad, sticky gum of it comes spilling out of me at the craziest times. He drinks a bottle of Bolt Seltzer, and I want to press his forehead to mine and kiss him. He writes a figure in his bank book, and I want to take him to the hard bed we're renting, lay him down on Janet's bleach sheets, watch him beg. He buttons his overcoat, and I want to drown in him. Please tell him I've called. Without saying goodbye, she rings off, 
and I'm left with the knotted, lonely loop of my morning. The phone slips out of my hand to its cradle, rattling emptiness. Next week, we'll leave for South Carolina. We've paid $50 for promotional cards and posters in Greenville, Anderson, and Abbeville, but that's only three cities, and beyond them, we don't know how long we'll stay. Eventually, our manager says, we'll hit Georgia, Alabama, Florida. We have no way of knowing what we're in for, no idea what new and outrageous indignities await us in the Deep South. Reven's told us to stay in the colored part of town, but even there, Jim Crow has found us. We could be killed for kissing in front of the white-owned soda shop, Sanders has warned us, for white people are offended by the notion of Negro love. We can't even think of flagging down a white taxi passing through, no matter how torrential the rains. We found Jim Crow's rebellious stepchild, too. The Negro woman who works at the colored window of Egan's Fish and Chips regularly gives away food when she takes a notion. I meant to ask my friend Caroline if she'll travel with us to South Carolina, maybe sell her cosmetics on the road, but I haven't even seen her to ask where she's been. So I'll take questions now. <laughs> yes. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the process of transitioning from a law student and a lawyer to um, a fiction writer um, was like for you, and also if you have any advice for um, someone in our shoes who might have, you know, similar lofty aspirations. Sure, sure. Um, so in, in some ways it was easy, and in some ways it was quite difficult. Um, I had, as I said, I had I'd actually arrived here with no notion whatsoever <coughs> that I wanted to be a writer, and I wasn't even writing um, when I got to Duke Law School. And sort of cross-registering in the English <laughs> department was like a little bit of a, an accidental whim, um, you know, at some point. But then I took that very first class, and I was like really happy, and the things I wrote were published, and, and I thought, well, here's some little thing, you know. Um, but then I took another class, and then I took that third class that I had to get a signature to take, right? Um, and it it turned into a thing that I was, like, very seriously doing. So when I um, graduated, I went to New York. Um, I, I was actually, I worked at Court TV for a little bit, and then I practiced for, for about four years. Um, and while I was, I just... I kept reading, and I kept writing, and I had very little idea um, about what I needed to do. But what I did was um, I kept doing the thing that the thing that seemed to be waking up my mind to to this. You know what I mean? Um, I kept reading. I would write in the mornings. I kept. Um, there's this great this great magazine called Poets and Writers that's a real window into the industry, um, and I just I subscribe to it. You know, I got to know people in the industry who were in New York um, on the weekends. I would go every weekend and do like one event. Um, so I I kept at it, and finally I applied. Um, I did an MFA. I mean, this isn't the path that everyone takes, but. I finally just, and, and this was maybe the terrifying part, you know, um, I finally decided, well, that's, I'm going to do it. And and since then, um, it was almost like getting married. Like, I just made a commitment, you know, <laughs> and, um, and, and never looked back. It's, um, you know, the, the publishing industry is in some ways very difficult difficult to break into initially. Um, I have found that once you are in, you're in, you know, it's almost like the Wizard of Oz is standing there, and once you get in the Emerald City, then everything turns magical. But um, it's also, it, it was it was very much a game that I just had to keep playing, you know, and, and what happens is a lot of people stop playing the game, and then you're left still playing, so... Yeah. So you mentioned that there were parts of this book that you kind of had to sacrifice on, like the altar of marketability. Um, do you feel like in your work subsequent that those parts have come up more often? <laughs> yes. So there was, um, I, I mean, it's funny, like I, I'm just making a connection after you asked the question. Um, there was in this book a, 
there was a character who was probably my favorite character in the whole book, and she was this um, prostitute down in Mississippi, and she was really funny and saucy. Um, and it occurs to me that she has, in some ways, become a character of the things I'm writing that are set in 2008, you know? Um, so it's so that I, I and I, I deeply, deeply believe what I said, that, that every character, every book, every story, it's as part of your psyche that you're just trying to get rid of. Um, she's still hanging around. I don't know what, <laughs> what this says about me, but yes. Yeah, but she was, um, there were 80 pages that disappeared from this book, and a lot of it was her. So. Where did the name of the book come from? Why? Um, so there's a, there's a scene in the book where, um, because this is a story about two friends, so one friend, when they're kids, she punches this boy and knocks his teeth out. The other friend's grand father says she's a monkey and her friend says no she's actually a saint so I'm not going to spoil the ending but it's shocking um somebody does something that just nobody in their right mind would do and and certainly this character would never do but the reason she does it is that she's able to see past someone's flaws to love them and I think ultimately that's what a lot of the book is about is that these characters keep seeing past each other's flaws and, and loving them anyway. So you mentioned in your acknowledgments that this um, is a story of resistance. Is, is, is that what you mean, what you just said, that the resistance to, to judging, or is it resistance to a uh, racist culture, or is it, I mean, what, it, there's so many ways in which you could mean that, and I'm just wondering what you Sure. Um, so, I, I feel like um, there, there, are, there are many layers of this, um, but one thing that happens is that the women in this book are very much constrained um, by not only time, but place, and also society. So there's one character in this book who stays behind in Kentucky. She wants to be an actress, but her father kills her mother, and she has to stay and take care of her sister. Um, she's very much constrained by time and place. But then the character who goes off to New York and becomes a jazz musician becomes in some way constrained by a lot of other things. I mean, she meets up against the glass ceiling of the jazz world. You know, you can only either marry into it or be born into it, no matter how brilliant you are in the 50s. Um, so that's, that's one form of resistance. Um, a lot of what drives the book is the idea that there, there's a, one of the main characters' father is um, in Biloxi in the Air Force, and he sort of um, undertakes this act of resistance against racism and then is punished for it and sent off to Korea, which is how he does. So I, I felt like it was about that as well. Um, and, and then, I mean, this isn't, this isn't too much of a spoiler, but in the end, one question that the book asks is, can you really leave home or, you know, and if you come back, is that failure? And I think ultimately the book resists that idea that it is a failure to come back home, you know, even when home is going to be a very constraining place. That's not necessarily the, the, the failure. Yes. Do you think law school made you a better writer or a worse writer? Or <laughs> definitely, <laughs> definitely a better writer. Um, in fact, it's funny. I remember. <laughs> I, re <laughs> I remember being in torts, thinking of all the just horrifying. I, and you know, now that I'm a parent and someone who has taken torts, it's like the whole world is full of horrifying possibilities, right? I mean, you read these cases and you think, you know, but but it does seriously. I think. Um, the exercise of, you know, having to analyze everything from a different angle and imagine all kinds of possibilities, ultimately, like, you know, it makes you a better writer. It makes you go out into the world and be able to sort of um, not only understand things, but um, 
create them in your head, if that makes sense. I also, I write a lot of, um, this, this is sort of, this is a different thing than what I'm writing now. What I'm writing now is a book that's set partially in Morocco um, and partially in Mauritania and partially here. And it's about this very kind of um, real thing that's going on of um, Mauritanian slavery. And, you know, I, I don't think I would have the same understanding of it if I wasn't trained um, as a lawyer. So it's made a big difference, yes. Yes. Did you um, did you find at all that it was hard to balance that creative aspect with the more stringent aspect of law school, or did you think feel like they overlapped well? Um, that's a good. That's a very good question. Um, I would say like there are you know as I said it, it, I was informed a lot by what I was reading and and sort of um, analyzing case law and everything like that. As far as the writing goes, I think it's similar to journalism in that it's a thing I would have to turn off when I started writing fiction. You know, um, I was a journalist for a bit as well, and the exercise of sort of writing short sentences in which the subject is always identified is is wholly different, right, from writing these long passages of scenery and, and dialogue. But but ultimately, I mean, they all, like, everything makes everything better. You know what I mean? I mean, I think um, the learning how to sort of economize words in a, in a brief or what have you is is a skill that you need to carry through, and, and learning how to sort of structure things is also a skill that's transferable to fiction writing. Yes. When you're coming up with ideas for what you want to write about for a topic, where do you look? You know, is it geography that inspires you or um, particular things that you read or people that you meet? Um, I've always wondered sort of how you get started. <laughs> sure. It's mostly the latter. Um, and, and small moments for me sometimes turn into big things. Um, so with the, the project I'm working on now, I was in northern Mali, and I was being led around by this this guide, and he said something about these slaves, and I was like, excuse me, what? And then he was like, no, 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 you misunderstood. We were speaking in French. He's like, you misunderstood. I was like, I didn't misunderstand anything. So then I started looking around, you know, and noticing, and when I got back to my home country, I was like reading about it. Um, and understanding that what I had seen was slavery. Um, I also, like, I, I will go to public places. I was at this baseball game once, and there was a little boy sitting in front of me, and his dad just kept plying him with food, you know. And, and I often ask questions if I see some strange situation like that. So that turned into a story that was about the fact that this kid's mother had just died, and the only way the dad knew how to sort of, you know, help the grief was to feed him. Um, so I find weird people and ask questions of myself about them. So if there are no more questions, I want to close with my favorite line of the book, which um, very much picks up with what you just said about small moments becoming big things. So this is just a one-liner from... Um, um, after the main character gets to New York. So it's a pretty bold move on her part, which is a little bit evocative of what you, what you just described, Jacinda, about deciding to commit to writing uh, without, I take it, much of a safety net. Um, and she's just been dropped off to where she's going to be living at her very, very first address by someone who it turns out is the August, whom she later marries. But she's just unpacking her things and just sensing the environment around her, including the burning vegetables and the noise of the traffic and so on. Um, and she says, I was happier than I'd ever been. And this is the line. A brave life would be made out of such foolish acts as this. I really love that line. Thank you. I thank you thank for that you. and the rest you. of the book. And um, join me in thanking. Thank you. Thank you.